Welcome, 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 everyone. I am thrilled to invite you to this new and special edition Claire has brought us together. If, you, if you're a regular member, give a wave to the camera. If you've been here before, we'd love to see all our returning members. And if it's this is your first time coming to Happy Space and being part of this to Hot Topics, wave the camera. If this is your first time coming to this, that's including me. So thrilled that we have brought some new people in together. Uh, I'm Robbie Samuels, and I am here because I thought this is really important. And I wanted Claire Kumar to feel like a special guest at her own event, which doesn't always happen when you're managing all of the, the technology and the chat and everything else. So I produce virtual events for a living, but there's been a through line of my work for the last 15 years, or maybe longer actually, last 25 years, uh, it's all about been inclusion and belonging and people being seen and respected and feeling welcomed into a space. And for a long time, I spoke about the difference between people who are extroverted like me, who get their energy back from being around lots of other people and people who might feel more introverted. And I also talked about the difference between being shy and outgoing and how these were sort of different scales. And in the last, I would say five years, the idea of talking also about how we, our brains are just different, like the neurodivergence, the neuro spiciness of all of us is something that is becoming more and more of a conversation topic but not usually in a public forum which is why i was so excited when claire said i really want to have a space for us to have this conversation so for context i am the parent of a child who's autistic and knowing that has helped me and my relationship but it's also meant I'm a better parent to all my kids uh, because when you're able to accommodate and be thoughtful about what it looks like to, to create a space where people can thrive, turns out it helps you know, how everyone thrives, which is true at home and it's true in the workplace. So without any further delay, I want to invite Claire up. And as I invite Claire up, I'm going to be launching a poll, which I'm going to leave up for a little bit. We're going to come back to this. So Claire, in case people keep coming in, let's come back to this. Um, as we shift out of your conversation with Melanie in a bit. So with that, let me now bring up Claire. And for this, Claire, you are in the spotlight, baby. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robbie, for being here. You're right. It's a load carrying everything. And what a dream to have a wonderful team to support me. And Robbie, your offer to, to be here as, as you know, you'll see in the poll questions, are you someone who identifies as autistic? Are you someone who's got an autistic colleague? Are you parent or guardian of someone who's autistic? Or do you simply want to become a better ally? And Robbie, you've said how this is significant for you. I have, it's, it's really interesting. I, I came to want to know more about autism as an extension of the work that I do as a neuroinclusivity advocate, as an advocate for invisible challenges in work and in our communities, I think my big mission is to stop the unintentional squandering of human potential. And we are often designed out for many reasons. I've identified as a highly sensitive person for a decade, and I was quite comfortable there, although I have to tell you, there's a couple of experiences this year, no, 2023, sorry, 2023, where I became part of other sensitive people communities, and I was a fish out of water. And so my, my curiosity around autism, though, stemmed from saying, you know what, I need to understand neurodivergence more deeply. I know a little bit about autism, but I don't know much. And I invited, and she's on the call right now, Melanie Diesel to join me. And Melanie is a two-time author, a speaker, a marketing expert, and also a late diagnosed autistic woman. And I thought, you know, we'd met at a conference and gravitated to this quiet place where we could really have a deep and meaningful conversation. We did that a couple of times um, when I've met Melanie. And we had a conversation about this topic, about autism and about what it's meant to her. And so I thought, I want to have Melanie on the show. And it was brewing for months. Well, I finally had Melanie on the show and the episode drops today. So you can go check out the, the episode with Melanie uh, today on the Happy Space podcast. But right now, I wanted to invite Melanie to this conversation in particular because it was my conversation with Melanie less than a month ago, about a month ago, less than a month ago, somewhere in there, that 
she was relaying all of her, her lived experience about what connected her to know that she had autism. And if you watch the podcast, you'll see this face make all kinds of funny faces as probably five, six, seven times during the hour long conversation or less than an hour. I had one aha moment after another. And it was my conversation with Melanie that made me say, there's more to autism than I thought. And I'll tell you what, I knew that autistic people stereotypically have a challenge making eye contact and that can feel somewhat overwhelming and too much. Well, I've never had a problem making eye contact. So I thought, ruled it out, ruled it out, absolutely. And I've been on a journey ever since that conversation with Melanie to explore more about what autism is and figure out if in fact it applies to me. But before I go to what I've learned, I would love to bring Melanie to the stage and uh, just wanted to thank you, Melanie. This is a deep personal thanks of mine for setting off those light bulbs and a line of inquiry that has proved very rewarding uh, from understanding myself. And I think it's also going to be beneficial in my life in untold ways going forward. But I wanted to just um, say hello to you and thank you and uh, maybe give you an opportunity to kick off our conversation together to share a little bit about what coming to your late diagnosis meant for you and how it's shaping your life today. Yeah, so thank you for having me. First of all, it's always a joy to spend time with you. And um, I was almost feeling um, choked up as you were talking about our conversation together because it meant so much to me to have such a deep and vulnerable conversation with you. Um, I was very similar to you in that my understanding of autism and, and especially autism in women was fairly minimal and based on, you know, the, the representation we're given in media, which is like prepubescent boys who like trains. And that's pretty much it. That's all we get. Um, and that if you are not in that category, it is very hard to see yourself represented. And so my understanding of autism and, and my cue to myself also came through conversations with people um, and consuming content online that sort of enlightened me to the fact that a lot of the stereotypes that I was aware of that I saw as disqualifying factors didn't actually apply, were not accurate, or were not fully representative of the spectrum of ways that autism can show up in, in women in particular. Um, so I could uh, info dump on this topic all day. Uh, lots of things that, that I could share about this, but um, all of this just to say that uh, please know that the, the vast amount of research that's been done, well, there's not much research that has been done on autism, nowhere near enough, but the vast majority of that research has been done on young boys. That is generally the target audience that they use for these studies, which means if you are, um, and they, they tend to be white and gender conforming. So if you are not in that category, there is a good chance that the way autism presents in you or in people like you is not well understood yet. And you have to seek out those lived experiences to get a better understanding of that. So community, as you said, Claire, is a, is a really important part of that process for a lot of late diagnosed folks. But for me, it has been uh, transformative. I feel like I know myself and like myself more than I ever have in my entire life, which is uh, you know, a weird thing to happen to you in your, in your 30s. I feel like I was supposed to know all that already. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Well, congratulations on yeah. moving to that state of grace. And uh, thank you for opening my eyes and starting the conversation. Thanks so much for being here today, too. I want to also thank Deborah, who you can see um, also on screen. And Deborah is someone who also provided me an opportunity for a safe exploration and discussion. And I wanted to thank you, Deborah, because you brought me to conversations with a therapist and uh, further learning on the journey and also a safe place to bounce around some of the feelings that were coming up for me. And 
I, I wanted to publicly thank you for that too, and also invite you to be part of this conversation. I know you have to leave and you can't be here for the whole thing, but I'm very happy that you're here now. And I wanted to give you an opportunity to perhaps share a little bit about your experience too. And just to let everybody know, we're gonna have some conversation like this. And and uh, definitely, as Robbie put in the chat, if you, a question is coming to your mind, definitely put a comment in the chat, preface it with caps question. Um, we like all the signage and wayfinding. Um, anybody with sensitivity, ADHD, all our neurodivergent brains want a safe container and lots of sense of what's coming and good direction. This is why I love Robbie so much. He's super calm and paves the way forward. I hope you all feel, um, feel that care and uh, attention. And Deborah, um, would you mind sharing a little bit about what coming to a late autism diagnosis has meant for you? Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much. It's so, it's so, so great to be here and, and having this conversation. And Clara, I don't know if you know that you were the person who actually pointed me to the HSP journey. And it was through HSP that I started to really think about what was going on for me. And so, um, and then it was a book by Janara Nirenberg, it was uh, Divergent Minds that, yep, <laughs> that kind of, it was the first time that I saw a, the female autism checklist, which is um, still not, if I understand correctly, part of the diagnostic tools. And so um, for me, I was feeling as you were, you know, kind of, um, good about where I was landing in life. I, you know, have a, a life that is very uh, fortunate. I've been in business for myself for 13 years. Things were going very well. And then I saw that checklist and all of a sudden, all the blocks started falling into place. And um, I started thinking about what I really, what do I really want? Because I am in this moment, the latest diagnosed person that I have met. So I was diagnosed at age 60, 60. And so here I am bopping along in life, feeling pretty well adjusted. And yet there were all these disparate pieces. And for me, it was looking for at this stage of life, what is the grand unifying theory for why all this stuff about me? I have more than half a dozen chronic health conditions. Um, I have different ways of being that I have adjusted my life to. And so it just kind of came to what is that grand unifying theory? And I was content without it. And then I was offered a diagnosis. Turns out I am autistic with a side order of ADHD and twice exceptional, which is part of what I think really got me here today. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's, I learned in the journey, I believe it's 50% of people with autism have ADHD as well. Yes. So that's why you might see AUDHD, ADHD yes. is, is sort of the way I hear it now. And uh, it's interesting in my own personal journey, I know that they're, they're one of my children has been diagnosed with ADHD. I see sensitivity. I see high, highly empathetic um, ways of being. And then I was reflecting back in my family and tracing the sense of line of sensitivity back through family and saw that. So uh, at first, before I share what I learned on Saturday in my assessment, I do just want to thank everyone for completing the poll. Uh, yeah, so we're going to give yeah. people like 10 more seconds. If you've just come in and you haven't filled it in, I think we actually, everyone who's here has filled it in. Let's let's end the poll and share the results then. And okay. so um, do you see the results on your end? I do. Fantastic. Yeah. Why don't you walk us through what you're seeing? Okay, so thank you, Robbie. Uh, we have 31% of people, so four, out of, uh, four people here are identifying as autistic. Uh, nobody here has recognized an autistic colleague or is aware, but I wonder, as we think of the population, I'm wondering if they're out there and not recognized. We have three who are the parent or guardian of an autistic child. 
And what I am so appreciative of here is that we have 69% here want to become a better ally. So um, can I just uh, applaud you and appreciate you really? Because that's how I came to it. You know, I just came back from doing a television segment in Hamilton about an hour mm -hmm. away. And I pitched this segment for Autism Awareness Month. I pitched this before I was going on this journey, which is really quite interesting. So at the beginning of the month, I'm coming into, I find out it's Autism Awareness Month. And by the end of the month, I can let you know that I am autistic. I got the diagnosis on Saturday and um, I've been going on a reflection journey thanks to Melanie's conversation uh, and, and thanks to Deb connecting me with a therapist and now reflecting on the minutia of my life and so many decisions I've made, so many ways I've shown up that really align so much with aspects of autism that I didn't know to be aspects of autism. So it was what was really, and what's really an interesting line of inquiry for me, and I'd love to open it up for questions on that front, um, is to think about what are the perceptions that, that you have of autism and the fact that it's this massive, massive spectrum now from, from a nonverbal presentation to a highly verbal presentation. <laughs> and so like, ah, like all the things through. So it's it, to me very puzzling. And I'm curious, um, I'm curious maybe from the people that do know around the traits of autism, Melanie, Deborah, and anyone else there, what are you noticing in terms of collective understanding and how well formed is our understanding of autism as a trait? If anyone would like to jump into the conversation, can you use the raised hand function, which is under the reactor reactions button, and then we'll queue up. I do see that Melanie was interested in jumping in. So I'm gonna bring Melanie back up on stage. Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, as you talked about the spectrum going from nonverbal to verbal, I think is one of the more unrecognized. And especially we see, at least the data shows that women tend to be more on that uh, extremely verbal side of things. Some of that may be socialization and our inability to live as uh, the selves we we would otherwise be. Um, but I think a lot of the the misconceptions, particularly around women, do have to do with socialization. The things that we would typically find comfort in or would typically turn to, uh, you know, as ways of expressing ourselves are less socially acceptable for women in many cases than they would be for men. Um, in the same way that like men are confident, but the women are bossy, we see the same thing showing up in like men are uh, organized and have leadership potential, but women are neurotic and type A and anal retentive. Like we get the same characteristics being characterized in a negative way and suffer for those characterizations. So I think um, that's where a lot of the misconception comes for women, especially, is that those characteristics are less socially acceptable and therefore we end up doing a lot of masking and a lot of uh, a lot of hiding that stuff yeah i want to come back to the masking i think what one thing that i've noticed right away is even when i was talking about exploring the diagnosis the immediate reaction people have is you no and which informs me that their expectations of autism are completely not presenting like this <laughs> so hey. I actually want to pause before we bring Deborah up and let's address this idea of masking because some people in the room may not be familiar with it and some people may not realize that they've been doing it like a lot in their life. So so what is masking from the what you've learned in the last little bit? So it's understanding the presentation, outward expression or presentation that is socially expected in a situation, whether it be work, family, community, generally public facing and demonstrating those behaviors, even though it's not naturally what you would do. So it, it I say it's like we have to pay a tax to be able to show that up. It's cognitively demanding to remember to. So here's an example. When I'm going through my Facebook feed and seeing comments, I will type out a reply 
that I think is perfectly exactly what I want to say. And then I will stop myself from hitting send. And I will say, go back and remember to add catching what somebody said and saying, thank you for you and showing them the, I can't just give where my brain went. I have to go back and say, great post. I learned, like, I have to validate what was there before rather than just jumping in with, here's what I thought. So that's, that's a little example of it's almost adding, I would say, social lubrication into the experience that we don't think is, I don't think is always necessary, but to be effective, my rational brain, and I love logic and I love rational when things make sense, I get it. And then I'll do it. If they don't make sense, I'm like, time out. I'm not on board. When I understand the connection to social lubrication and ultimate effectiveness, I'm in. So that's a, that's a, I like this definition. definition that Melanie put in here, hypervigilance to how you are perceived often resulting in forced behaviors, hidden behaviors, and artificial behaviors. Let's well, bring so Deborah back more articulate. up. Thank you. Melanie. Well, it, you know, she's, you know, written about it. <laughs> All right. Deborah, um, uh, is coming back up and Deborah, you have a podcast on this topic. I do. So our podcast is, uh, neurodivergently coaching. And specifically, it's a podcast for coaches um, and uh, also a community, uh, which is a continuing professional development community. So Claire, back to your question, just to reframe it again for Deborah's benefit. You were asking okay. about traits and behaviors in women, I believe. Yeah. So sort of what's come up for you and what do you what do you notice is the expected perception of autism and versus what we know more fully it to be. Yeah. So where I come to that question is from uh, a social justice perspective and noticing, um, <laughs> noticing how white we all are here. Um, and so one of the things my, uh, my podcast host and uh, co-host and I, do is we come from completely different perspectives and this is so for me what comes up is recognition diagnosis and treatment what are the socio-political and economic elements of that there was a a significant amount of privilege that allowed me choice to as to whether or not i wanted a diagnosis and then there was also uh, a, a financial element in, in getting a diagnosis. So quite a lot of privilege there. Um, and then the other thing that's coming up for me is the disclosure of personal medical information. So my diagnosis of ADHD 2E is my personal medical information. And so the depending on where I'm at, whether or not I will simply call myself a member of the neurodivergent community mm -hmm. um, in order to demonstrate that I don't, that one does not have to disclose one's personal medical information mm -hmm. in order to gain credibility in this conversation. It should be enough um, that, that I can show up and speak to it. And there's, I think, a lot to that. That's kind of where I'm coming from. Uh, what is twice exceptional? Um, Again, you won't find a, a particular, you won't find a singular definition. What it might have meant when I was in grade school is that I was working ahead of my grade. What it generally means in life in this moment is smarter than the average bear, I think is usually the way that I would say it. I Thank love you. That. <laughs> yeah. Um, Melanie, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I just wanted to point out, and Claire, we talked about this when you were discussing with me about starting your own journey. Mm -hmm. um, I am absolutely baffled that you managed to get your answer so quickly because I was on a waiting list for 10 months before I could even have the consultation and then had to wait quite some time after that to get the results of that. Um, so that's, I mean, I'm in the US, our healthcare system is what it is, and it's very different from, from what you have. And I think that comes to the privilege that Deborah was talking about too, you know, whether you have insurance, whether depending on which, you know, healthcare system you're in could, could really change your ability to, to even access that, even if you wanted to. Yeah. You know, just on that note, I will shout out, I have created what I call inclusivities 
And one of them reads diagnosis is privilege. And I created that a couple of years ago, that term, because of the difficulty getting ADHD diagnosis and now a better understanding about autism diagnosis. So I will share what happened to fast track it. Uh, it's because of Deborah, actually. So I ended up working with a psychotherapist in the US who specializes in understanding women and neurodiversity. And I went through her process and was able to get uh, in pretty short order. Yes, I, if I had waited through our personal, our, our healthcare system here, years, and if I wanted to go privately here, thousands of dollars. So, and my insurance, my insurance would have through my ex-husband would have maybe covered $500 of it. So I just decided to invest in this because, because if I'm going to be an advocate in this space, I thought I really want to be really clear about what, where I'm coming from. And I've been, oh, I've been so frustrated that the highly sensitive temperament is not often included in conversations around neurodivergency. So I feel like I've, there's a subway door and the doors are closing and I'm like, yo, I am part of this conversation and I'm going to be here. Janara Nuremberg gets it. There's a good chunk of highly sensitive people, I think because of negative perceptions of autism are like, ah, that's not me. I don't want to be, I don't want to be considered autistic. So there's a lot of stigma still that uh, exists here. I see that Deborah's here uh, and she's going to have to go in a moment. So I'm going to bring her back up and then I'd like to bring myself up after this. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, I do have to jump off in a minute or two. Um, I appreciate, Melanie, you bringing that, that uh, idea forward. Um, and one of the things for me was, um, first of all, I didn't want to go into the medical system that was going to offer me a free diagnosis here in where I am. Um, and for me, being so late diagnosed, one of the things that um, I have to consider, which is really super important to me, and I'm still um, grappling with it, which is because of the way that I got my medical diagnosis, diagnosis through the US and it was direct, I have a choice now whether it's entered on my personal medical records. And as I'm aging and perhaps not as able to speak for myself, I, I haven't quite decided where I land in terms of having this entered on my personal medical records. And so that, um, that privilege and power of choice remains with me. And it is absolutely a privilege. I'm so sorry, but I do have to jump off. I wish I could stay. I promise you, I will listen to the end of this. Thanks for being here, Deborah. Thanks so much. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, you know, we, we're talking a lot about late in life, but often the reason, particularly women, are finding out that this might be a story for them is their children are being diagnosed. And there's that moment where it, it starts to click, like as that happens. So I just wanted to share, like I, my kid was, my first was in preschool in a mixed classroom. Half the class was enrolled tuition and the other half had an IEP. And we didn't know that when we chose this preschool. So the teacher had that lens. Mm -hmm. um, she, she had information that we didn't have. Also, we, it was our first child. So we don't know what a three-year-old is supposed to do or all that. And her approach, we had built a really strong friendship. Her approach to this conversation was very backpedaling as she was suggesting, very sensitive and concerned. And I remember just being like, oh, do you think we should go for a diagnosis? And her being like, well, I mean, I can't. And I was like, yeah, it makes sense. So we should have more information. And then she was like, well, and I don't know. I'm like, oh, no, my wife's gonna be totally on board. Like the fact that I knew that we would be united, I discovered was very rare and sometimes gets in the way of kids getting access and that there's all these other things. And it's that stigma that got brought up a moment ago. The stigma is why the teacher was nervous to bring it up to me. All I saw was more information, more resources. Let's support my kid. Help me be a better parent. That's how I was interpreting it but that's not the norm. And so a lot of the delay might also be, even as you suspect, you're concerned about getting 
making this more real. I'm curious for you, Claire, that background. Mm -hmm. In a month, you <laughs> you went from, huh, maybe yeah. to self-diagnosis, which we'll talk again about that is completely valid and and further diagnosis is not needed. Just right. getting information for yourself might be all you need. And that's great. Um, to you having a diagnosis. So where's the stigma in your conversation? Is it you were prepared because of the HSP work you've been doing? Like what made it easier for you? Because you went through like the seven layers, you know, of emotions yeah. super quickly. And other people sitting on this call might be having the aha moment that you had with Melanie and not know what to do next with it because yeah. they're not going to smoothly move forward. Yeah. Well, you know what I credit? Autism. And I'll tell you why. What landed for me in talking to Melanie were things like having all the questions about everything, just one question after another, like needing to deeply understand something, being very wed to appreciating logic. So you can imagine when a new question comes up for me, I got to wrestle with that question until I understand it. And so I got to be like, okay, I need all the information. And Melanie care, um, kindly dropped a couple of tests, uh, the RADS test. And there was another one on the same, same page, R-A-A-D-S plus Embrace Autism, I think is the site. And that evening I went through the test and it, you can score from zero to 240. Well, I scored 124. And that's the pretty close to the average score for someone with autism. The threshold was 65. So I was like, oh, that's more than a little suggestion. That's a, like a hell yes. So there was another test and that's what conclusively led me forward. So honestly, it's this appetite for, for deprocessing. And then here's the other, I think, beautiful piece, which explains a lot about me. I need to to speak truth i am always see it say it and so i'm on the journey to understanding and then on tv today before we had this segment tim bowen says so do you know anyone with autism is there anyone close to you with autism? And I'm like, well i just got diagnosed on the weekend and he was like what and so we opened the TV segment with a, so like, what, what does that mean for you? You know, so very, very zero to a hundred in terms of choosing to talk about this and having it go on air uh, and publicly broadcast. But I'm, I think because I've always been see it, say it sometimes too fast. Sometimes my mom's like, you need a filter in there somewhere. It's missing. <laughs> see it. And it's out. It explains my need to speak up. And I've been looking for research to say, you know, what's the temperament type to speak up? And I did not find it in high sensitivity. I'm reading and interviewing this afternoon, Ludmila Praslova, who is a PhD in organizational behavior and the author of The Canary Code. The book drops May 7th. And uh, it'll be our next podcast uh, episode to drop as well. So definitely listen to Melanie and I, and definitely listen to Lidmilla and I. I have every confidence that's going to be a really rich discussion because she's written a book. And in the book is the first time I've seen a sentence that correlates, gives me an understanding for me of where my need to speak up comes from. And it's that deep processing and also deep need to truth tell. So when I had a CEO last year tell me, Claire, you know, when you say things, I recoil a little bit, but then I think about them and I realize they make a lot of sense. I'm working on the anti-recoil strategy all the time. I'm thinking, how do I, how do I figure out that? Like, how do I have the softening? Because I see it, say it, and I have a compelling need, especially when I see the impact is bigger than me. I have to speak up. And mm. so all of that made the journey inevitable for me. Appreciate that. I see Melanie has got a hand raised as well. So I just wanted to share, Claire, I know you mentioned that after our conversation, you went and did the tests. I shared the link in uh, the chat. So Claire messaged and said, okay, I took a test like 
now what? And I was like, that's a really good point. I, I also went on this like now what binge and you kind of just go into a wormhole of research. We're known for hyperfixation. It happens. So I figured I probably should put together some stuff to hopefully shortcut some of that, make it a little easier. So the, you know, put together that, that list of uh, sources, resources that may help if you're in that questioning phase. Um, but I love the way you're talking about the, the way you just say the things that you feel, the things that you see. Um, and I, I mentioned it too. I think it's tied to oftentimes a strong sense of, of justice is really common in terms of whether whether that presents as disregard for authority because I don't believe the authority is valid in this instance or isn't correct, whether that's like attention to social justice issues and just this is the logical way this should play out. I'm therefore unable to accept this, you know, bigoted, misogynist, some other less logical, um, you know, application. And I, I love that you've come to that so quickly because I think that's a, a beautiful thing. You, before your, before this process, you had always talked about how you speak truth to power. And, and one of the first times that we connected was actually at that conference you mentioned when you spoke up for all of us who were covering our ears from the screechy microphone and said, could we pause and figure out the microphone situation and then proceed? Uh, and I was like, what a badass, like, she's awesome. Like, I, I, I wanna learn to do that. Um, and I think it's so funny because we were both pre-diagnosis at that point. And so looking back at it, I think is is really cool now to see that we were, we were living it up uh, without even knowing. <laughs> Well, and feeling all kinds of, why am I the only one to do this sometimes, right? Um, for for those that are um, looking at the chat, you'll see it's Mel Melanie Diesel at substack.substack.com and uh, resources so you think you might is the search string. But I want to, uh, for people who are listening to the recording, I want you to all be able to grab that. Look up Mel Melanie Diesel and Diesel is D E Z I E L. And you'll find her on Substack with some really riveting writing uh, on this. So, uh, yeah, that was I went immediately and read that as well. That was I'm thinking you're going to want to take these notes from the chat and make a little uh, notes addendum for wherever you share the replay, because there are some really rich uh, resources uh, and information in there. And so if you are listening in right now and you have something you want to share like that or even you just want to grab the mic, if you want to uh, share an experience, you can use your raised hand. I had a question for you, though, um, Claire. Uh, when did you first embrace HSP? And could you give some context for some of us are newer to your community? Um, what is what is HSP? And, and how did that initially sort of feel like a fit for you before you had this other diagnosis to lean into? Yeah, thank you. It came about between nine and 10 years ago. And you know what? I don't remember what brought me to the book, but it, it's Elaine Aaron's work and her book, her 25th anniversary edition is, you can't see it so well, um, but it's a yellow copy there of the highly sensitive person. And she's the researcher, a psychologist who identified and really did the first body of work on the trait to really name it. And now there are many, many people around the world researching it. It's a temperament trait. And what's interesting is there's no diagnosis for this trait that affects about one in five. More research now, if you're looking at sensitivity, I take the high out of it when they talk about the fact that it's really a bell curve of being sensitive, more sensitive or less sensitive. You sort of see 30, 40, 30%. And, but I still think really high sensitivity is probably around the one in five. And it brings me to the point that, I, I mean, I identified with the trait because there are a few things, I've written a blog post on it. Um, Raphael, you might be able to find the link to the DOES blog post on my site and drop that in the chat. But um, DOES is, is Elaine Aaron's acronym for high sensitivity, it was deep processing, overstimulation, empathy, and emotional responsiveness, and sensitivity to stimuli. And as I want to do when things don't feel well ordered, I reorganize them. So I rewrote that as the seed model of high sensitivity. So Raphael, that's how you'll find that one uh, on the blog post, the seed model of high sensitivity. And seed is sensitivity to stimuli, which there's a plus and a minus. There's the 
gosh, I notice everything. Amazing. And oh my gosh, I'm overstimulated by everything. Not so amazing. There's empathy, which is fabulous. I care about everything. And oh my God, exhausting because I care about everything. Then emotional responsiveness, which is, I broke out as its, its own because I think it's very important. And in fact, Elaine's rewriting them and breaking it out as well. Um, emotional responsiveness, great. You More in my brain fires and I will have a heightened emotional response to positive and negative. And my perfect example of this, and I no diagnosis, just my observation, Will Smith at the Oscars, incredible elation in one minute, incredible unleashing in the next minute. And so emotional responsiveness, you couldn't ask for a better demonstration of that. And D, which is what Elaine anchors the trait really on is this deep thinking, lots of um, neurons firing, connecting all the dots. And that's similar in autism. So is emotional responsiveness. So is sensory stimulation. So there's incredible, incredible overlap. There isn't, I must speak truth to power. I must, I'm compelled to hold on to logic. I think that's where I'm seeing a divergence between the two. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of debate and discussion as people are invited to unpack this. And I will be doing some of the inviting on that. I actually want to also note that given the audience we have today, we have about 20 people here on Zoom uh, coming and going. And I believe almost all of us in this room, with the exception of me and maybe a couple of others, are identifying as women. And I just think having a space for people who identify as women or non-binary to have that conversation is, I think, incredibly rare, which is partly why I was so excited for what you were doing. Um, do you see or, and Melanie, I see is still here. Are, is this starting to happen more? Because of course, this late in life diagnosis is probably not gonna resonate as strongly for men because they were all being diagnosed and, and medicated, uh, maybe initially with ADHD. Um, you know, even for me, I'm thinking about the eighties, like there was a big prevalence of suddenly everyone was ADHD. And, it, and I think now there's the same response where everyone's like, God, now everyone's autistic. How is that happening? It's like, well, no, it's just, we're now more education. So, um, I see, I see that, uh, uh, Melanie has her hand up, but before she jumps in, um, what are your thoughts, Claire? Uh, I think it's very important. I think a lot of awareness is coming through our kids being diagnosed the way the way you you've had a child and become much more versed in it. I, I've heard people say if your kid's been diagnosed, you may want to check and see where it lies because it does generally flow genetically. Uh, I think I think it's really important to have these spaces. And the great thing is, I think it's going to travel like wildfire because, Traditionally, what I've observed is women are ready to talk to other women about stuff. So now that we bring topics out of taboo, like miscarriage and menopause, hopefully this one will be a, hey, how does your brain work? And where do you fit in? And that's what I'm trying to normalize as a discussion too with the Happy Space Work Style Profile, because I want to bring different ways of thinking. I have an inclusivity as well that says productivity is personal. I'm, I'm all about this conversation that says we need to know each other. If we're going to work together, we really ought to spend a few minutes to kind of understand how somebody works and how they're going to approach their work. And then we can have much more dancing where we're not stepping on each other's toes. I love that. You're absolutely right. I think uh, what I have found is uh, I'm in the process of writing a book on late diagnosis in women. And um, I'm finding lots of things that, that echo exactly what you were saying. One major factor is that the, the proliferation of technology has allowed us to democratize this conversation a bit. As we said, historically, the research that was being done by male-dominated academic institutions featuring male-dominated uh, study participants uh, were leaving us out. And so this, this ability to, whether it's TikTok or Reddit or any of the other places where these conversations are happening, the ability for women to connect with one another, to share a lived experience like, like I did on your, on your show, Claire, is creating what they call diagnostic domino effect that not only allows you to identify, I mean, if I hadn't found my, my diagnosis, maybe that wouldn't have come to you as quickly. My mother was diagnosed after I was because she filled out the form and was like, I did all of those things. 
I have news for you, mom. So, you know, we create this diagnostic domino effect when we share our stories, when we share our perspectives. And it's part of why I know that you already feel so passionately about this. And I do too, that sharing these stories is what's going to allow, hopefully, that diagnosis age gap to close. Because what we know right now is that 80% of autistic women are still undiagnosed by the time they reach age 18. 18. That's the time typically when schooling and counselors and all the others who are in your day-to-day life would normally suggest or identify you as perhaps being autistic. So the likelihood of your diagnosis drops dramatically after 18. So if we're sharing these stories, hopefully we can get to a point where professionals have enough knowledge to spot these women, these girls, before they reach 18, before their chance at having accommodations and and learning about themselves earlier in life is gone. And I think the more we talk about it, the the better that chance is. Yeah, I I love that point so much. And one of the big reflections I've had is going back to 2007, when I tumbled down the stairs and realized I couldn't sustain the life and work as it was created right then. I I didn't have a diagnosis to point to. And we have a very medical model of disability and accommodation. I am really wondering if I revisited that now and said, yo, this I could point to. I don't know if I don't know if it's autistic burnout, but I certainly couldn't, I couldn't take the construct of work as it was. It was too overwhelming, too exhausting. And I needed to work part-time to make it work. And I was denied that flexibility. And so I look at what does this awareness do to enable a, a fairer um, and more equitable and, and flexible condition for us to be able to operate in? And is there a path here towards opening the opportunity for a lot more people through this understanding? I know that in the UK, lawsuits have increased that lawsuits that mention neurodivergence as a reason to you know stake a claim for accommodation have grown from three in 2017 to 284 last year so there's there's it's not a hockey so like this is exponential what's happening in the conversation in terms of understanding and awareness i want to just touch on um, this piece about diagnosis, because Deborah sort of sort of mentioned this that you know she she has a diagnosis, but she's deciding whether to put it into her actual record. Um, and and we also said very clearly and with standby, self diagnosis is total legitimate. But then there are situations where you need the piece of paper because we live in a medicalized society, mm-hmm. and whether it's a lawsuit or trying to get a certain accommodation in a workplace that's just not very forgiving (laughs) or willing to treat you as a human. Um, So there's these moments where, you know, the, the rubber hits the road and the desire to just kind of like know thyself versus medicalize thyself in order to get what you need. um, It's still a really big tension. And I'm curious, Claire, how you've thought about it in the, you know, two days (laughs) that you've had. And then I'm guessing, because Melanie has already raised her hand, that she's got some thoughts on this too. But um, I thought what Deborah said about getting diagnosis and deciding whether to put it in her medical record, that's a really interesting observation. And for her, the factor was age, mm-hmm. because she said, I may not be the one making choices, you know, and, and maybe if you're in your 30s, you're not thinking that way yet. So it's, I thought this is a very interesting thing that's dovetails yeah. so many other pieces of the conversation. Yeah, I love the question. And I think it's looking at the ROI and disclosure, um, potentially. Um, I think Deborah's concern is stigmatism. And I'm hoping that more conversations and awareness will collectively rise. So that will diminish, but you never know. It's going to be subject to who you meet at what time and whatever bias is there, um, which will will continue. Um, I think for myself, it's I really want to wake up the corporate world to move to have accommodations. I'm just because now I can identify as actually autistic. I can retire my maybe autistic hashtag that I've used for the past month and move to actually autistic. Just because I'm clear now on where I am doesn't mean I feel like leaving the HSPs that are stranded in a no man's land. Um, with nothing to point to, I really want to elevate the comprehension and and compassion of organizations to figure out how to move more effectively to a needs-based accommodation model. 
and designing for the margins, as Ludmilla points out in her book, if we design for the margins and we expect those margins to be there, we don't, we don't, we no longer need that doctor's note. So that's my goal. Hopefully, by the time I have uh, medical reasons, and, and, and um, I haven't had that same concern as Deborah, but she's very astute, connecting all the dots and asking all the questions, and has a really strong sense of social justice. So I'm going to be really following her journey as well. Um, I know I want to bring Melanie on, but I, there was a question I just want to make sure we answer. How is autistic burnout different than burnout in another case? Yeah. So my guess at it, and I'm going to jump to Melanie um, to clarify because she's further down the road than I am. I would say it would relate to the autistic way of being and those stresses and taxes that we pay contributing to the inability to continue on in in the construct of work or school or whatever it is that becomes the tax if i had had accommodations that respected my temperament i don't think i would have burnt out there was no disinterest in working hard and contributing or ability to do so it was all around sensory overstimulation and exhaustion um melanie what do you think yeah, so autistic burnout uh, is different than than how we use burnout more generally, largely in that it's much more difficult to recover from. Uh, on average, if someone is burnt out, maybe they take a vacation, they take a day off, they go get their nails done, you know, they they play video games for a couple hours and they feel refreshed. The challenge with autistic burnout is that when you wake up the next day, the world is still overwhelming. You still have too many commitments than you're able to keep up with physically. You still have all these expectations. You know, you're still in the heat of it and that is never going to change, right? By and large, we still have to exist in this capitalist hellscape and we have to keep ourselves alive and we have to care for others and we have to pay bills. And so there's this sense of it's very difficult to recover from autistic burnout and as a result, while when we say someone's burnt out, we might they might feel better after a week or a few weeks, maybe they have had a traumatic experience. Uh, autistic burnout tends to last months or years because it is very difficult to get enough reprieve to really fully recover from that. Um, I did just wanna make one note on the uh, the medical side of things. Obviously, I am I think what Deborah's doing is incredible. Um, and I love that she has control over that information. I think, especially if you're in a marginalized group to have control of that information, your health information and determine when it's advantageous to you when you get the ROI, like you were saying, Claire, is mm -hmm. so smart. Um, the one thing I will note is that there are a lot of conditions that are much higher, much higher likelihood in autistic populations than the general public. And I personally have had uh, I was diagnosed with a connective tissue disorder uh, that sort of deteriorating muscles and tendons essentially. And the only reason I got that diagnosis because I had been going through months and months of testing and, and trying to figure it out was once I got my autism diagnosis, the doctor was able to say, well, this thing is super rare in the general population, but with autistics, it's a much higher amount. Let's get you, let's do genetic testing for that. And it's probably the only way I solve that medical mystery that on average, that particular condition takes 10 to 15 years to reach diagnosis. And I was able to do it in only a, a few. So just keeping that in mind, it doesn't mean you need to disclose when you're not comfortable, but if like Deborah, you're also experiencing some chronic illness and some other symptoms, it's worth at least you being aware and looking into the fact that there are some conditions that you may be at a heightened risk for, and perhaps having that, that conversation off the record or yeah. in some way with a medical professional to make sure you're getting taken care of in the way you need to. Yeah, I did have um, a conversation in my assessment around, it's not just cognitive processing, it's inflammatory. Inf in, in the immune system and inflammatory I issues. And so it makes sense. I've been public about my MS for about seven years now and no, less than seven years, I think. Um, but it took me seven years to, to say it. So it's only been three or four that I've been talking about it publicly, but there's a very high correlation and muscle, muscle tension as well is something. And so my massage therapy is not a nice to have. It's actually... I feel dramatically different as soon as that that therapy has happened. So um, I think, yeah, I think there's a lot more to understand there. And uh, Robbie, I'm going to throw it back to you uh, now to yeah, guide us. Yeah, I, this has been an incredibly rich conversation. Um, and I'm wondering if anyone who hasn't yet been part of this would like to share their reaction to it. 
Like some of you came to learn, some of you had a moment of self-reflection because of your own identity and way of being in the world. Maybe there's people you know. Um, so if anyone would like to either share in chat or if you want the mic, just uh, use the raised hand and we'll bring you up. We have a few minutes before we'll do a close. So I wanted to create space for someone. You don't, you don't have to have an answer or even a question. It could just be, wow, this part really resonated with me or hadn't I learned this thing. So we're going to do the the thing the called wait time in the world of education. We're going to give you a moment to think about whether that's going to be something you'd like to share. Meanwhile, Claire, take a look at what's happening in chat. And um, in a moment, I'll come to you and ask if you'd like to uh, share that. Everyone who was just multitasking, that bit of silence, which was not even eight seconds, made you come and look at your computer again, realizing that maybe it had stopped working. <laughs> That's one way, by the way, to actually get people's attention. Um, so uh, this is really interesting. I'm seeing in chat, Melanie, uh, you're writing about EDS. And um, uh, I, you're, you're now the second person I know, the other person I've gotten to know really well. Um, the idea that this could be a crossover with autistics is very interesting um because it's it's hard to diagnose um and something that really impacts so much of your life um so there's a question from leona i do wonder is the under diagnosis of women have cor any correlation with the 80 percent of chronic illness sufferers being women so basically the sort of idea that we're kind of combining these two i mean it's true if if medicine early on was measured based on men's body weight and mass um we have not gotten that far from that medical model so i think that could be an interesting thing to consider um yeah. I think there may be something to that. I've always thought that, so MS is a issue that affects your nerves. It becomes a disorder in the blood, essentially, then it affects your nerves. Uh, but I think it's largely, there's a lot of overstimulation. And when you're someone who senses everything, I think when you're in a world that's designed to overstimulate you chronically, unless you've figured out the boundary setting, the work-life redesign, to take yourself out of what could potentially be burning you out consistently, then I think you're you're susceptible, whether it be emotional stress. I was in a not great marriage for far, far too long. Mm. I was at work, which was demanding too much for me, not the work, but the whole construct around it. So I really, and a lot of my coaching with people is around work-life design to set you up for what sets you up to continue giving your best to the world. So mm -hmm. that's, that for me is, is paramount. As we wrap up, uh, and Anne, thank you for your comment in chat. Um, Raphael, could you put in contact information uh, for Claire? Uh, we want to make sure people know how to get to her podcast, her, her inclusities, inclusivities. Inclusivities. I can't say it right. Inclusivity. Inclusivities. Inclusivities. Yeah. So um, <laughs> uh, great t-shirts with great slogans, bright colors. Um, uh, you just you have so many resources, you have this amazing community. Now that you're registered, you'll also be learning about upcoming topics. So every month, this is a space that Claire hosts for a real conversation about really important you know topics that maybe we don't get to have with each other. Um, so thank you for being here, and um, we'll we'll make sure those uh, information goes in chat again. Claire, I'm gonna give you the spotlight again. Any closing thoughts? Just a huge thanks. I come back to that 69% of you are here because you want to be a better ally. So thank you so much for that initiative to have a deeper understanding. Stay tuned on this space because you know it, I see it, I say it, there's going to be more <laughs> to uncover and more opportunity to support that allyship that many of you are interested in. For those of you who are saying, oh my gosh, this is potentially me. Join too. Uh, the Happy Space Pod is a place I hang out there. We've got, I think, 508, 509 members in the, in the group now. And it is a safe space on Facebook to share what you observe, questions. There has never been a negative down experience in there. It is, is one safe place to hang out. And I would love to invite you all to stay in conversation with me there as well. And with that, friends, thank you so much for being here. We're honored that you participate in this conversation, even as an engaged participant listening in. And there'll be a replay available. Thanks, Claire. Thanks for making this happen. Thanks so much, everyone.